Sling and things. Sup, everyone. And as the voice of God just told you, this is Sling and Things, a show where yours truly reviews things while web slinging around in the Spider Man game from 2018. And normally, as I want to do, I would begin this series with a tedious 15 minute explanation detailing every boring detail about why this video exists and who I am and what I hope to accomplish, and what the meaning of life is. But really, this is pretty self-explanatory. I like reviewing things, and I love this game. I love just diving in and out of this world, literally, and leaping between buildings. It's kind of therapeutic. So whenever I want to review stuff, I'm going to do it while having this on in the background. Simple, right? And I was racking my brain trying to determine what I should review to lead off slinging things. You know, like, what's a good opener to hook people? And then it occurred to me, well, why don't I just review the Spider-Man comic book, since this game happened to come with a free trial of Marvel's digital library. So, that's what I'm doing, slash did. For today's episode, I read the first ten issues of the original Amazing Spider-Man comic from 1963 as well as the first comic that Spider-Man ever appeared in, Amazing Fantasy No. 15, which came out in 1962. And of course, both comics were written by Stan Lee. I am a massive Spider-Man fan, as the existence of the series would suggest, but I had never read a Spider-Man comic before this review, and that's largely because I'm a completionist, and it's very intimidating to go near a series that has hundreds and hundreds of editions and spans many decades. And it doesn't help that I'm also obsessive compulsive and it would be like a burden for me to have to keep track of this massive never ending series. It's just easier for me to jump into comics and graphic novels and manga periodically as opposed to like, you know, assigning it to myself for the rest of my life. Still, I was curious how well the original comics would hold up. And to be honest, I was kind of preparing myself for them to not hold up, which is no slight to Spider-Man. It's just that it's rare for things from, you know, the 1960s to hold up well. I watched the first five James Bond movies recently, and the first Bond movie came out the same year that Spider-Man debuted. And James Bond, those early movies may hold up. They are still well-made, entertaining movies. But the character of James Bond does not hold up at all. There are scenes where he is open hand slapping women for no reason. There are scenes where he's holding women against their will while he's trying to kiss them. And it's just impossible to watch those movies without coming away thinking, this is from a different time, a lot of this does not translate. Which is a good thing. And I was stealing myself to have a similar reaction to early 60s Spider-Man. But to my pleasant surprise... His first 11 issues hold up really well. The only times it ever feels dated is whenever a character uses lingo from the 1960s. Like when Peter Parker exclaims, This double identity jazz is for the birds. Or when a person references the Ed Sullivan show or Fats Domino. Or uses a word like skin flint or rough neck or greenback. Words I had practically never read before. Otherwise, it's surprisingly easy to just jump back in and follow Spider-Man's first steps. And I think a large reason for that is that Stan Lee and Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby, or whoever you want to give the most credit for creating Spider-Man, absolutely nailed his design right off the bat. Spider-Man's suit is so damn cool that you don't even really have to change it. You can roll out Spider-Man today in his classic outfit and it would hold up. It would still look really badass, which you can't say about almost any other superhero who predates the 1970s. Like, I also love Batman, because who doesn't love Batman? But Batman's suit is constantly getting upgraded and tweaked and modified. Whereas with Spider-Man, any changes to his design are purely cosmetic. They're not necessary. The only real edit made from the way Spider-Man looked in the beginning is that in the beginning, he was given these web wings, which come out of his armpits, and they look really bizarre. They look like netting that you'd find in a baseball game more than cobwebs. And uh, surprisingly, I cut ahead to find out when Marvel stopped giving him web wings, and he had them for almost a hundred issues before they finally made the decision to axe them. It took Marvel almost a decade 
for them to remove his armpit webs, which was a great decision because while some spiders have wings, most spiders don't, so it's weird for him to have them unless he's specifically using them to glide or whatever in special occasions. Speaking of webbing, one thing that was interesting about the early issues of Spider-Man is that Marvel hadn't quite figured out how his powers should be implemented at first, so in the beginning, he's kind of more like Netman than Spider-Man. He's a little like the Green Lantern in that he makes objects from his webbing, like he makes a parachute out of webs, he makes water shoes out of them, he makes projectiles out of them. And he's also a little like Batman in that early on, he totally has his own spider signal, which he shines on walls to alert villains of his presence. That too is something I'm glad they nixed from his character, because Spider-Man's abilities should be limited to what a spider can do. And spiders don't carry around electronic projectors that let people know when they're in the area, so... The spider signal was not necessary. My one gripe, and it is my one gripe, with Spider-Man's powers is that I really prefer the Sam Raimi version where his webbing comes from inside his body. I've never quite gotten used to the idea that his webbing, in most versions, comes from web shooters that he invents separately. And that's what he does in the original comic, too. You see him building it himself. To me, it's just odd that he could create that himself because he didn't need to get bitten by a radioactive spider to have maybe the most integral part of his spider powers, which to me kind of defeats the purpose of getting bitten by the spider. And plus, they establish that Spider-Man has radioactive blood and that his entire DNA has basically been rewritten because of this spider bite. It gives him super strength, it gives him the ability to not have to wear glasses, it gives him a spider sense that alerts him to danger. So to me, it doesn't seem like that much of a stretch that his body would also be able to generate webbing, since that's what a real spider does too. I mean, you know, it's not a big deal, it's just my preference, but I think it's more intuitive that all his power should come from getting bit by a radioactive spider. And that is a hill I will die on, damn it. Uh, otherwise, though, Spider-Man's origins are almost identical to how they're depicted in later versions. He gets bitten by a radioactive spider, he starts clinging to walls, he gets cocky, he becomes a wrestler, he refuses to stop a bad guy, and then that bad guy winds up killing his Uncle Ben, which more or less puts him on the path to using his powers with greater responsibility, and also to sell photos of himself to J. Jonah Jameson. The thing that I love about Spider-Man is that he is as vulnerable as a superhero could possibly be. It's not just that his personal life is flawed, and it is. In the early Amazing Spider-Man issues, not only does he have no friends, everyone he knows bullies him and treats him like garbage and is actively rooting for him to fail. Like, he gets insulted every time he talks to any of his classmates. They all hate him for some reason. But it's not just that he starts off as a scrawny teenager or that he doesn't even have parents in the picture. It's that he gets his ass kicked in almost every fight he gets into. His powers are the perfect balance of being formidable while not being so imposing that he's impervious to getting harmed. You don't have to be Thanos to hurt Spider-Man. A really strong thug with a gun or a billy club is absolutely capable of harming him, which is perfect because it means that he never goes into a fight with a ridiculous advantage against anyone else, even if they don't have superpowers. You always feel like he has to struggle if he's going to get the job done, even if the job is something like subduing a robot that's out of control or subduing a dude with a lasso. Another thing that's interesting about Spider-Man is that the villains in his world mostly become villains by accident. It happens to them randomly more than anything. In the first 10 issues, we see the debut of the Lizard, Dr. Octopus, Electro, Sandman, and the Vulture. And of those five, only the Vulture actually went out of his way to develop a supervillain shtick on purpose. Everyone else got their abilities by happenstance. And I think this is another reason why Spider-Man is such an enduring character. For one thing, like Batman, he is approachable enough that it's easy to pit relatable villains against him. It's not like, you know, I love Superman too, but Superman can be so incredibly powerful at his peak that unless he's facing off against some alien monster like Darkseid or Doomsday, 
There's not a lot of people who can credibly challenge him, which is why if you look at the best versions of Superman, they tend to be when he's depowered, when he's not so overwhelming that there's this huge gap between him and every other superhero, and only gods can stand a chance against him. But you never have to worry about that with Spider-Man, who can be threatened by pretty much anyone, because his powers, as great as they are, are also very limited. And the fact that Spider-Man has maybe the best cast of villains outside of Batman, is a real thing that makes him stand out above almost every other comic book character. For instance, if you asked me to name the five greatest supervillains who are exclusive to the Hulk, or who are exclusive to Iron Man, or who are exclusive to the Flash, I couldn't do it. And even if I could, I probably wouldn't find them that captivating because... Their powers are all so awesome that it's hard for a random person to be their equal. But that's not the case with Spider-Man. Spider-Man is never that far away from being like an ordinary person. And that gap gets even thinner when we realize that even though he is a superhero, it doesn't make his life any less difficult. In fact, if anything, it tends to bring him more heartbreak. It isn't fun being Spider-Man, but it's something he has to do, what with the great power and all. And it seems simplistic, but yeah, seeing him struggle is part of what's endearing about him. And the fact that so many people can make him struggle, can give him problems, is part of what makes him Spider-Man. Reading these early comics did teach me something else about Spider-Man, which is that crossovers have always been natural to him. So before I read these issues, I always kind of looked at those Avengers team-ups as an unnatural coming together as something that was like forced into existence because, you know, capitalistic Marvel knew it would make a lot of money, more than because these characters would ever actually like interact with each other. But lo and behold, Spider-Man meets the Fantastic Four in the very first edition of The Amazing Spider-Man. Spider-Man begins with a crossover, and in issue number five, he fights freaking Doctor Doom. So big crossover events, it turns out, were never unnatural to Spider-Man. From the very beginning, he and other Marvel heroes were weaving in and out of each other's stories. Which is interesting, and I think it's a big reason why the Avengers work so well in practice. Because they pretty much always coexisted anyway. And also, it certainly helps that the vast majority of the legacy Marvel characters were all created by, like, the same three people. So it made it easier for characters to cross-pollinate. Whereas that's not quite the case with DC. Like, Stan Lee created Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four, so it makes sense why Spider-Man ran into Johnny Torch a bunch of times when the Spider-Man comic was just starting out and when he may have needed the Fantastic Four bump. Which is funny to say now, because these days, Spider-Man is way more popular than the Fantastic Four, but hey, things change. Overall, I did enjoy going back and reading the first issues that featured Spider-Man. The only downside for me was that Reading comics digitally is nowhere near as enjoyable as reading them in print, especially if you don't have, like, a, a really good tablet. And there are times when you're going to have to strain your eyes to pick up details about what's happening in certain panels, and that's unfortunate, and I know that when I was done reading Amazing Spider-Man 10, I totally had a headache going on because it felt like I was looking at a zoomed-in version of each panel. Like, some of these panels... Uh, they weren't meant to be zoomed in, like, 500%. At the risk of sounding like a romantic, I'm a huge art fan. That's why this series literally begins with art. And there's nothing like holding art in your hands and being able to flip between it naturally. Like, to me, there's a huge difference between seeing a massive spread out of a photo on paper and seeing that same photograph on a website. The prior makes it feel more alive, more real. The latter makes it feel more antiseptic. And I know it can be very expensive to have a comic book collection, and it can take up a lot of space, especially if you're a completionist for something as massive as Spider-Man. So I'm not anti-digital reading, because it's practical for most people. The fact that you can get all these comics online in an instant is awesome. But if you are planning to dive into the world of comic books, and if you can somehow get a hold of the print versions of them without it inconveniencing you, I guarantee it's a better experience than reading it digitally. And I know I'm fighting against progress when I say that, but it's true. And plus, 
You spend all day looking at screens anyway, so why do it if you don't have to? But yeah, it was informative and fun to go back and read Spider-Man's origins and to pay tribute to a legend. And even if some of the art is kind of, you know, old-fashioned e by today's standards, if nothing else, it'll just give you more of an appreciation for how freaking awesome comic books look today. And like I said, it's way too much of a commitment for me to follow any gigantic series that continues forever and ever and ever and never stops. But if I had to, if I was going to commit myself to one of these series, I would absolutely read all the Spider-Man issues, because he lends himself to good literature. You can build really compelling, really interesting stories around Spider-Man, and that's because at the end of the day, for all his abilities, he's still human, and he suffers and struggles and he faces a lot of hardship even when he does have the mask on. In other words, he's relatable. He's as down-to-earth as a super-powered, super-scientist, muscular genius prodigy can be. Hmm. But, is he more relatable than another four-syllable protagonist? One whose last name also starts with the letter P, and who may or may not be a drug dealer? There's only one way to find out that I can think of. Wink, wink.